Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you very much, Ian, for inviting me over here. Um, we met at the University of Bristol, Ian and I, when I came there first to, to work as a research assistant. He was finishing up his PhD. And, and then I stayed at the University of Bristol for 20 years, but then moved to Iceland. So I had a longer trip to do than, than just on the train today. So what I have been doing in the last few years is to look into how long our natural resources will last. And with particular respect to metals that we use for our infrastructure and technology uh, and phosphorus that we need for our food production. And um, what I have discovered in doing that is that these resources are actually at the base of our economy. So we, we could say that the earth is shrinking because um, at the beginning of the 19th century, we had almost eight global hectares to support each person on Earth. And now we're at, at 2016 with less than two global hectares. And this is the land that we need to support um, uh, our consumption and our waste, as well as the sea we need to foster our fish. And if, if Earth population continues to grow, as, as the UN predicts, then we will have less than one and a half at the, uh, at begin, at the middle, in the middle of the century. And collectively, we are now using 1.6 Earths every year. And this, of course, is unsustainable. And that's why we need to have a big rethink about how we live on this planet of ours. Now, it doesn't matter where we look, um, we, the, the, the temperature is rising, uh, the terrestrial biosphere is, is in degradation, um, inequality is tremendous. Um, data from the World Bank shows a, a difference in average income between the poorest and, and, and richest nations to be on the, uh, on the order of one, one to 180. And 63 individuals have as much wealth as half of the uh, poorest part of the world's population. Now, many of these things were predicted already. Um, Malthus talked about the limits to, um, to uh, resources and population in the 18th century. And then Dennis and Donella Meadows and co-workers wrote the report Limits to Growth in 1972 for the Club of Rome. And they uh, ran several uh, analyses where they looked at natural resources and, 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 and interaction with, with rising population. And in one of the scenarios, which is generally referred to as the standard run, uh, they, they came out with the analysis that uh, at the beginning of the century we live in now, because of um, resource restrictions and, um, and population rise, uh, our economy would start to, to suffer um, in, in addition to our ecosystems. Uh, the, the report uh, was criticized in, by by the, the neoclassical economic uh, paradigm. And now we have revisited this report and we have followed the standard run. They, they had other scenarios which were completely ignored uh, in the criticism. So we are now at the, at the edge of a huge change because we population has continued to rise and we live on one limited earth. And to my big surprise, it was actually, there was a, a, a committee, an old party parliamentary committee that was discussing limits to growth recently uh, with a report that came out in April. So the British government is now um, um, aware of these issues. But this had, has already been discussed before the limits to growth report. Um, Kenneth Bolting, an economist from uh, the University of Boulder, uh, uh, once stated, anyone who believes that unlimited growth is possible in a limited world is either a madman 
or an economist. And his colleague, um, Albert Allen Bartlett, a physicist, he also stated uh, that the greatest imperfection of mankind is that it does not understand the consequences of exponential growth. And I think this is really at the core of the problem. Now, an economic growth takes place when people take natural resources and transform them into something more valuable. And this is the basis of, of our economy. So, we took the natural resources and their extraction rates over the past century, from 1900 to 2010, and you can see that this is a logarithmic graph, and you remember from your maths class that if you take the logarithm of an exponential curve, you get the line. So this shows exponential uh, growth and extraction of various resources from molybdenum to niobium with phosphite also the, um, amongst these. And you can see that this has continued to increase uh, year by year uh, at about a growth rate of 3.5 to 7 percent increase. And you can imagine on a limited planet that this is not possible um, uh, uh, into, into the distant future. So we um, started to look at what are the natural resources at the basis of our economy. And that, uh, um, so we have analyzed so far over 40 different natural resources. We, we use several different methods to, to estimate how long they can last. We use business as usual, um, time between peak um, discovery and peak production. Um, Hubbard curves, as, as used by King Hubbard, the oil geologist in the United States in the 1950s. And then we use system dynamic models like those in limits to growth. Uh, so the first diagnostic indicator is burn-off. That is, we look at the extraction uh, per year and the reserves. And we can see how long, if we continue as today, how long can they last. And this table, everything that's red in the first column there, shows us resources um, that will uh, be used up this century. And then when the colors get, uh, when it gets orange, it will last uh, into 200 years. Light orange is, is uh, between, in a, goes up to 1,000 years. Yellow is up to 2,000 years. And green, uh, then longer time than that. So as I go further to the right in the table, first we start recycling by 50%, then recycling 90%, then recycling um, uh, 95%, and then you can see that, that we are getting the resources to last you know, into thousands of years. In the last two columns, we reduce the population by half. And then you can see we can have tens of thousands of years of some of the resources. This is not to say that we should reach, dramatically re reduce the population on Earth, although we have demonstrated uh, that the Earth can really only support about three billion people. So this just shows that population recycling and consumption is incredibly important. Another method we used was um, Peak discovery, uh, there's a, dif a difference of 40 years between peak discovery and peak production. And this has been shown for several resources. This, shows, um, this was predicted um, in, in, in the 1960s when, when there was peak discovery of oil, that oil production uh, peak would be uh, around the year 2000, and that has uh, proved to be the case. And if we look at many other resources, like um, oil in Russia and global oil and gold, there is a 40-year delay between peak discovery and peak uh, pr uh, production. Then we used Hubbard curves, as we has been used for oil. Many geologists have told us we could not do this with metals, but we have found that, that uh, it can't be done. And you can see that here that we have gone peak production of gold uh, and fossil fuels, uh, we are right there. Soils, we have gone to the peak, uh, peak of tilled soils and fish 
um, fish, uh, fishing, uh, we, we've reached the peak, and, and the others we will reach within the next 40 years. So, and then the final method we used was uh, to build the system dynamic models, which includes um, energy, uh, societal actions, uh, population, food, and agricultural land and soils. And uh, this has been put together with a, an econometric model from a, a, a German colleagues. And now this is our world model, where we are, um, which we are still building um, with the with the aid of, of 12 new PhD students that have joined our program. Uh, just to show you uh, here the steel, iron and steel model, what goes into it, we, we look at into, um, we, we make a flow diagram of, of the resources and, and how they are linked. And then we can uh, uh, run iron and compare iron here, the Hubbard model where we have different, different um, grades of ore. And then this is the system dynamic models, which in, includes also uh, population and price modules and recycling. And you can see that the Hubbard curves and the model curves are very similar. Steep, um, we will have peak steel production in the year 2030. And just think about the infrastructure that relies on iron. Um, and so uh, this will have serious consequences for, uh, for us because we are here at the ore great cliff. Uh, we are still uh, managing in, uh, 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 using ores that have high grade, but, but we are about to go to much lower grade and then we will need much more energy to win it. So, we have we are past peak for peak production for four um, resor nine resources. Uh, another five will peak in the next ten years. Six will peak between ten and twenty years from now. Another four will peak between twenty and thirty years from now. When it when the when we hit peak production, that means we still have half of it left. But these are the great and uh, the ores and 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 resources which are deeper, more difficult to get, uh, needs more energy, um, and so on. So then the te technocrats say, well, we can just substitute. But we can only substitute at this table because um, we produce 90%, 90 times more iron than copper so that we could maybe use iron for some of copper, but never copper for, for iron and, and so on. So there is a limit in, in the physical um, uh, production as well as the functionality of metals to substitution. There is also a limit in energy. Um, we, we are just about to hit, to hit global energy production uh, when peak uh, oil, coal, and gas will all come together. And renewable energy will never uh, replace the energy we produce by fossil fuels. Uh, what is green there and blue in the table, blue is hydro, we can put a dam on few, a few more rivers. Green is the wind and the solar and the wave energy that we can produce. It can never replace the cheap oil that fuels our economy today. And here we see peak oil as demonstrated by Colin Campbell, a British oil geologist, which shows that in 1900s we had a full glass of oil. In 2000 we had half a glass, in 2100 we'll have empty, an empty glass. So, this is our uh, global energy sub-module in the systems um, uh, systems world model, and we have included here everything, and you can see that uh, even, e even if we frack everything, um, the, the all oil and gas and coal will, will be declining all this century, and the only way that we can con continue into the next um, uh, centuries with 
high energy production, though lower than we do today, is by using thorium. And there's quite a lot of thorium research going on in the world today. Okay, we also live in a very linear world. So if we, if we throw away all our, our resources uh, into landfills, then we need to dig a lot out of the mountains. But if we recycle 90%, then we only need to take 10% um, out of the mountains. So this is incredibly uh, important. And we also need to understand that at the bottom of, of if, if we look at a society like an ecosystem, then we use energy and materials and phosphorus to produce food and people. And that is the first um, trophic level of our ecosystem. The second trophic level is, is where we live, we, we do work and we produce wealth. And then on top of that, we can have civilization and creativity. If we don't have the resources, we can't do this. And um, so I'm running out of time, I'm sure. So, um, and this is, this is important to show you because, and we have looked into several civilizations uh, in the past. We, if we, we look at energy here as resources, then we come to a time when, when we have peak production of, of, of resources, and, and then there is a t t 20 to 30 year uh, delay before we have wealth um, a peak, and then we have a, a cost peak, and after that, we, our civilization will start to decline. And we, we have tested this on several civilizations, and our predictions um, are the same as the observed ones. So here is where we are. Um, global maximum resource outputs um, are now, and in the next 10 or 20 years. Um, the global uh, maximum wealth will be around 2030, and global cost will outrun wealth uh, around 2050. Okay, so energy is a challenge. Oil will no longer fuel the, the, the economy that we, we live in. Um, we can have some limited resource substitution. We need to recycle really seriously. We can maybe have some economic growth through recycling, I don't know. Um, we cannot afford business as usual, that is absolutely clear. And we need some social innovation, we need to tackle corruption, that's an issue I haven't been able to talk about. Um, and we definitely need some new development indicators. So, um, this is why we all need to engage in sustainability science, because we will no longer be able to live in, in an unaltered world as we do today. And we have already started seeing um, the, the economic uh, difficulties that are coming up by the collapse of the Greek economy, by the collapse of, 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 of uh, the Spanish economy, by the state of the British economy, by the state of the US economy. It's all here, but it's not being exposed. So sorry to leave you uh, with this pessimistic message, but I'm a, an optimist and I'm sure that we, if we all work together, we can build a different world. Thank you.